Goddess Kring Radio, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, 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 Make sure to make enough money. Watch out because we don't have a lot of social infrastructure to help us if we're struggling and there's no rent control in Seattle. I'll say that I'm very, very lucky that I, this is I think the third um, landlord in a row that I've found nice landlords that refuse to play the game of thinking they have to charge market rate. So I actually have uh, a one bedroom apartment that's below market rate. I pay a few hundred dollars less than what market rate would be for my apartment here in a kind of near central district of Seattle. So I'm very, very lucky. And um, I know rent is out of control in Seattle, but I'll say part of my work addiction might be because of you know being afraid of running out of money but the truth about me is I'm a I'm a full-time freelance figure model for art classes and I started doing that um, in 1992 I am an artist myself my mother is a visual artist and I was sort of raised in a very creative atmosphere and she put me in alternative schools and I was lucky enough to have really good um, art and music teachers and theater and humanities teachers at South Woodby High School on Woodby Island. And I will say that my workaholism, I don't know if I should really call myself a workaholic. That's a very kind of negative word. Um, but I was going to say, it's funny, I don't drink or smoke or, or do drugs. I don't even smoke marijuana. Most of my friends um, are, are more marijuana friendly than I am. I, I believe in legalizing it's an herb. It's a medicinal herb and um, also a recreational herb, but it's not something that I'm not into smoking marijuana. Um, a lot of people think that I do when they look at my artwork. They assume that I get stoned a lot, but I don't. But um, my brain is kind of naturally in an altered state. But I will say that I love to work. I, I don't like to spend money. I love to make money, although I'm still considered low income. But I was going to say I started modeling in 1992, modeling nude for art classes, uh, because I needed... Kitty, kitty? Oh, my kitty wants to play. I have a kitty named Kisun, a big orange fluffy kitty named Kisun, and he wants to play. I might have to go and play with him. But I wanted to talk about my job. My job is that I'm a full-time freelance art model. That uh, means I model nude for drawing and painting and sculpture classes. Sometimes I model for photographers. Mostly I model for myself when I take photos. But um, I make a living and I work at like 20 or 30 different places. I've also modeled in Portland and San Diego and New Jersey and different places when I've gone on trips. But I model nude for art classes uh, and I also work with medical schools, a couple different medical schools here in Seattle, who hire people to pretend to be patients. And so we get paid to um, act out symptoms and roles of, of patients based on real cases. And then the medical students need to practice uh, physical exams on us as well as language, medical language, and come up with a treatment plan. So that's work that I really, really enjoy. So it's not like I'm a workaholic who works 16 hours a day and doesn't do anything else, but it's true that I try to take a day off and I, I can't, like this weekend I was going to be off and I ended up taking a shift on Saturday and Sunday. So this week I work seven days a week. I think I had like seven art model gigs, two medical model gigs. And then I have a job where I deliver groceries for this company. And then I also do organic food demos in a certain natural health food store um, randomly. So, and then I also get hired as a photographer. And I also, so I do all these random things for a living. And I like to make money and I like to try new things. And I forgot what the point of this is. I guess my social life, I don't really have, I'm kind of a loner. I guess I wanted to talk about my own particular peculiarities. I guess this is kind of an audio diary. This is Shannon Kringen's audio diary that you're listening to. I am a 47-year-old, actually October 25th, 
2016, I will turn, I will have turned 48. That hasn't happened yet as I'm recording this, but when you're listening to this, it might have already happened. Actually, yeah, I think I already turned 48 by the time you're going to be listening to this. Hello, audience. How are you? So I'm 48 years old, and I live in a one-bedroom apartment with my kitty. And for the last over, like, for like 24 years, I've been modeling for art classes, and then I also get hired um, as a photographer and I've sold different artworks of mine and I just make a living in a lot of different ways. I haven't had like a normal full-time job since like 1997 I think was the last time and actually it wasn't even full-time that was part-time. I worked at a Xerox place which I won't mention the name of but um, for about three years I worked um, cashier swing shift but that wasn't even a a full-time kind of thing. It was mostly I was mostly modeling even back then so From 1992 on, I've been really, really, really into modeling as much as I possibly can. Although recently I've gotten a little tired and I have a little less stamina. Figure modeling takes a lot of stamina. That's when you, the classes are three to four hours long. And sometimes it's one pose for the whole three or four hour class. And figure models basically, usually we pose for 20 minutes and then we get a five minute break. And then about halfway through the class, we get a 15-minute break. It's the long break, and everyone in the class enjoys taking a long break. Sometimes you get like a 20- or 30-minute break. If it's a four-hour class, some schools give us a 20-, 30-minute break, to, you know, like a meal break. But it's basically modeling for art classes, I guess, is a kind of an odd thing to do for a living, but I've done it for so many years, it just seems normal to me. So I guess, you know, you listening, maybe you have never really thought much about, you know, how does it work? You know, I show up with a robe and some sandals, (laughs) and I actually don't really have a robe. Most models have robes. I just have like this dress that I wear that's easy on, easy off. And sometimes they hire us also for portrait where we're not nude and we wear like a v-neck shirt or sometimes a costume, sometimes a colorful costume. So figure modeling is something I've done for many years and I, I was raised by a mother who appreciated abstract design more than realism and I have to say that most people I think think that real art is the realistic art and then abstract art is just, you know, not real art. But I will say that in the world, there's a lot of abstract art that is really not very well designed. So design principles apply whether it's abstract art or realistic art. So now I'm rambling about art. See, I went from figure modeling to art. I would just say that it's interesting. I model for um, artists that paint and draw in a more realistic way, whereas my own personal preference for art, because I'm also an artist myself, The reason why I got into art modeling is because it pays by the hour and it's guaranteed money, whereas we all know when you're an artist, you don't always know how you're going to make a living. And so I got into, I thought I was going to be a graphic designer. After high school, I went to graphic design school and I did a two-year graphic design program and I did really well in that, but I I don't think my heart was really in. I love design, but I don't really want to be a graphic designer for advertising. So I mostly use my graphic design skills in my own art. I've done um, silk screening. So now I'm rambling about art. See, it's really hard for me to stay on one topic. I started talking about being a workaholic or my my uh, life as a full-time freelance person. And then I morphed into figure modeling and what that means. And then I morphed into abstract art. I was going to say my favorite artist is a man named Hunderwasser. He is from Vienna. He passed away in, I think, the year 2000, and he was in his 80s. He is inspired partly by um, Gaudi, the architect um, from Spain, as well as Gustav Klimt. Uh, He did the famous painting called The Kiss, and there's a lot of gold um, texture in with those paintings. Look up Gustav Klimt and um, Hunderwasser. Hunderwasser is not someone that a lot of Americans know about. My mom taught me about him. He believed in no straight lines, and he was a very improvisational, self-taught artist. He went to art school, and they told him what to do, so he dropped out (laughs) because he already had his own strong ideas of what he needed to do. And in his lifetime, he was a very successful artist. He helped design buildings. He wasn't actually an official architect, but he had strong ideas about architecture and how buildings should be in harmony with nature. 
and so a lot of his buildings are very curvy and organic, a little bit like Gaudi except more colorful. You know, Gaudi does those amazing, the, the La Familia, whatever that's called in Barcelona, Spain. I actually went to Barcelona, Spain in part just to see the Gaudi buildings, which I loved. And I went to Vienna, Austria to see the Hunderwasser Museum. There's a building in uh, Vienna, Austria that was designed by Hunderwasser, and it's an apartment building as well as an art museum that houses his paintings. And there's curvy, like the floor is all curvy and organic, and the shapes are all curvy, and kind of like how I'm doing an improv right now. Everything is curvy and organic and natural and <laughs> not very linear. Uh, so I work a lot. I work seven days a week sometimes, and I was beating myself up for that, and then I realized because I'm not really very social, like the way my life works is I do have a boyfriend, this really interesting guy that I met. He is a photographer and he's in a rock and roll cover band and he's a private person so I'm not going to say a whole lot about him, although he's totally supportive of me doing this show and uh, of my artwork. He's a really nice person that cheers me on with my creative projects. And my love life has been really rocky, so I feel very fortunate that I met somebody that I connect with romantically, and he's a good friend of mine, and like, you know, we have a solid friendship, and we give each other space, like he does his music and his photography, and I do my multimedia art. So my love life actually is going well, and I've been dating him for over two years, or just about two years, but we've been friends for like two and a half years, so we were friends first and then started dating and we're very different in some ways and yet we're similar in other ways so somehow that works and I'm very very fortunate because I I do have challenges of of OCD you know obsessive compulsive thinking and part of my uh, working a lot maybe is about that I feel like more safe and grounded when I'm working when I when I earn money it's not just about making money because you know I'm not even wealthy I'm pretty low income actually by mainstream American standards, I'm low income, uh, but I will say that I love the energy flow of doing, providing a service like being a model for medical and art students and then, or even delivering groceries, which actually doesn't pay very well, but it's kind of fun to zip around. I have like a little tiny fuel efficient car. I never had a car before actually. I got my driver's license in my early 40s and about four years ago I bought a used little tiny uh, car and it gets really good gas mileage and I zip around and I, I just love to to drive around and make money um, delivering things and groceries basically with a smartphone app. It's interesting there's ways to make money now with your smartphone. I didn't really want to talk about making money, making money because this is non-commercial radio which I was also going to say it's really refreshing because I'm not a huge fan of capitalism like I like aspects of capitalism but when capitalism bleeds into our healthcare system, that's when it's not good. Um, you know, if everyone thinks that the main point of, of life is to make money, make money, make money, and be really competitive, that's a rat race and that's stressful, especially when it comes to healthcare. Healthcare should be an, a nonprofit public service, just kind of like the public library. Like, imagine if you went to the public library and you had to pay $600 to check out a library book, you know, nobody would be checking out library books. Uh, there'd probably be black market libraries that give free books out. So it's kind of like our healthcare system, you know, when they charge a woman $30,000 to have a C-section. I mean, in other countries, that's unheard of. I have friends in, in England and Norway and Scotland and France and Russia, even in Russia, and, you know, you don't get charged $30,000 to give birth. So that's a very American capitalist. Our health care system is insane. Although I will say I love my Obamacare. I'm a low income and I have um, basically Medicare or Medicaid or whatever it's called, the, the low income kind of health care. I have no copay. I mean, I live in Washington State, USA, so that's very, um, I think we're lucky here. I don't think it's like that all across the nation. It would be nice since we're called the United States if we have like a united healthcare system, like a national, federal, non-profit, socialized healthcare system. My friend in England, actually, a very small amount of his paycheck is taken for national health insurance, smaller than I thought. Like I think he makes like about 2,000 a month, and only about 150 of that 
or 100 is for his health care portion. And if he had no job, he would still be able to go to the doctor. So if you're a British UK citizen, you can still go to the doctor even if you're poor or unemployed. But if you are employed, they take a small percentage of your paycheck and that goes towards the national health insurance. And then when you go to the doctor, there's no bill. And that's considered very normal because it's like a public service. So I was just going to say, when you go to the library and check out a library book, you know, you don't expect that it's going to be like $300 or $600 to check out a library book. You know, we all share the public library and the public library is funded. And I love the library. I mean, go in there and have Wi-Fi and watch movies and educate yourself with books. And, I mean, the library is a sanctuary. And I wish our health care system was, was more considered a public service like the fire department, the police department. You know, uh, part of society like our mass transit and our public roads, you know, we all use the health care system. Every single human being, you know, needs medical care. So there's my rant on that. But I was going to say that um, socialized democracy, I, was a, I, I still am a big Bernie Sanders fan, and um, this election is really stressing me out, and I'm glad it's over soon. I would love to have a female president. I don't really want to mention the politicians' names, but I would love to have a female president. But I would also love to have a really progressive person in there, as much like Bernie Sanders as possible, in terms of you know, get the money out of politics, get the profit out of politics, and get the whole, I know, but that's not like that. Our political system in the USA is kind of like Hollywood showbiz, you know, very competitive, very commercial, lots of money involved. So it's sad, but um, the real issues, I love what, what Bernie Sanders talked about in terms of taking care of the planet, respecting Native Americans, having more solar power, more electric cars, more sustainable uh, ways of having electricity and power in the world and less war and more diplomacy and acknowledge, you know, police brutality, acknowledge racism, sexism, classism. I would also expand that to include speciesism. You know, when human beings, when we think we're the most important species on the planet, I think we're a little bit out of control with that because we're, you know, chopping down a lot of trees and destroying the ecosystem so I would include speciesism. I'm not even sure if that's really a word, but speciesism is something that I really um, think about sometimes the way humans dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. I actually wrote a poem on that, and I played that last week about humans. If you go to my website, shannonkringen.com slash, I think it's Kring Music. I have all kinds of MP3s. You can listen to that one. I think it's called Smell the Hitler. Wake up and smell the Hitler done to Mother Earth. Wake up and smell the Hitler done to Mother Earth. And then it goes on. You know, humans dominate this planet. I can hardly stand it. That's one of my Kring speak-isms. I've always loved plants and animals. And I have, uh, I also volunteer at the zoo, which some people are offended by. They think zoos are very, very negative. I think that it is sad that the habitat is being destroyed of many natural creatures, and I also found out that up to 50% of, of baby lions and tigers don't even survive in the wild because it's so dangerous, uh, mostly from nature, uh, predators and other lions and tigers killing each other, but also because the habitat is, is going. So when I, see, when I go to the zoo, I feel like, you know, you could say the animals are held captive. You could also say they're protected. So it depends on how you look at it. It's all relative. And I think that the zoo probably does more good than harm. But I know people have sent me articles on how bad zoos are. I still believe that the zoo is more positive than negative, but I don't see it as a black or white issue. I see it as gray. I see it as you know, what human beings have done to the planet Earth is pretty, like, we're very creative. You know, we do, we invented fracking. I mean, we invented all kinds of wacky stuff. I think fracking is not something I'm a fan of. I'm a big fan of solar power. I'm a big fan of protecting the ecosystem and cleaning up the ocean. There's so much plastic in the ocean and all this kind of stuff. But, okay, so I will just say that, uh, let's just say I'm a huge Bernie Sanders fan for all of those reasons, because he talks about the real issues, the economic injustice, the racism, sexism, classism, taking care of planet Earth, 
realizing we are part of nature and not separate from nature, respecting the wisdom of Native Americans, as well as recognizing the treaties that we're not really following, apparently. And with all the pipeline stuff going on, it's really sad to see that, you know, what the people want is for the pipeline to not happen, and then the corporations are basically bossing the people around, and that's really sad. So I am a big fan of putting the earth first and human beings taking care of the earth, whether you're an atheist or a religious person. I do feel, whether you believe in evolution or you believe in creation or whatever you believe in, I believe that science and spirit are the same thing. Like, in other words, the only kind of science I believe in and the only kind of spiritual religious beliefs I believe in are when science and spirituality line up, which means there's wisdom. There's non-duality and there's wisdom. My mom studies Advaita Vedanta, which is non-duality in Hinduism, and it's, it's a very wise... I was raised on Krishnamurti and all kinds of interesting philosophy about Eastern philosophy and about the oneness of the universe and consciousness and how we are conscious beings that manifest and create with our creative minds. So I was fortunate to be raised with that. There's a lot of dark things about my childhood, but I will say the wonderful things about my childhood is that both my parents, they divorced when I was four. They're both highly sensitive they love animals just like I do. They're kind, they're intelligent. They raised me to question everything and do what I believe in. And they didn't put a lot of pressure on me to conform and be like a normal person. But I will say that I have a fear of success. I, I, I definitely fear failure. I mean, don't we all? Nobody wants to completely fail. It's embarrassing. But I also fear success. I, I'm afraid that being successful means I'm egotistical and narcissistic and um, on a power trip or that I'm a fraud. I mean, all these different things. Like, there's that famous quote, um, what really fear, what we really fear is, is being great and who am I to think I'm great? And then there, it's saying that don't fear your own power. I don't know if it's Nelson Mandela or Marion Williamson who, who, um, invented that quote. Maybe I'll try to find that quote later, but I'm just doing a random monologue right now, rambling on. For those of you who know me from my Goddess Kring TV show, this is what I used to do. I used to dance around naked, fully naked. Since I was a figure model, I was used to being naked. So I would dance around fully naked and make things up off the top of my head and talk about philosophy and personal issues and public issues and just everything. So this is this is me, Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring, and um, this is part of my life, just sharing what's going on with me, and this week I work seven days every single day. I, I did several art modeling gigs, a couple metal, medical modeling gigs, a, a natural uh, food demo at a health food store, and uh, deliver groceries and do a lot of things. So, and now I'm recording my voice. Thank you for listening. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down. Glory, glory, glory hallelujah, want to get beyond the duality. when I lay, lay my, my burden down. Glory, leg, 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 Oh.
distance. Glory, glory, hallelujah, as I lay my burden down. So I recorded that uh, a few years ago, and a friend of mine and me worked on that after I recorded my voice a cappella. Glory, glory, hallelujah, as I lay my burden down, trying not to drown. No. Um, yeah, that's part of what drives me in life is to fantasize that I can let go of all of my baggage, but so far I haven't done that. I'm 48 years old, and today I rode my bike in the rain to a modeling job, and then I came home and hang out with my kitty, and now I'm going to go back out there and ride my bike and go to another modeling gig, and this one is a, a costume one for a drawing session at night. And now hear this. Thanks for tuning in to Goddess Kring Radio. Go to shannonkringen.com to see my various blogs and visual art. I mostly am a photographer, and I have got Flickr feed, and I, I offer my photos under Creative Commons license, free to publish, free to share, love questions, comments, etc. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, let's face our demons. This is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to Goddess Kring Radio. And I'm thinking about my demons. Happy birthday, Shannon Kringen. Guess what? I turned 48 on October 25th, 2016. I was born in 1968 in San Diego, California. Tecalote Canyon, Shannon, Canyon, Shannon. Tecalote Canyon, Shannon, Shannon B. Bannon. Yeah, I was born in 1968 in San Diego, California. And it's now 2016. So I am now 48 years old. And I have been uh, figure modeling for art classes for exactly 50% of my life. I started when I was 24 years old in the early 90s and now I am 48 so that's a trip so it's interesting that I'm old enough to say that I can remember 30 or 40 actually I can remember 40 years ago 40 years ago I was eight years old that's just bizarre so I feel like I want to face some of my demons right now earlier tonight my boyfriend was telling me because he's very different from me. He's a musician and a photographer. Uh, he just does what he wants, and he doesn't, like, have a bunch of conflicts. I am very complicated. I I tend to think that I should do something or I shouldn't do something, and I procrastinate, and I have to push myself. And I did a public access TV show called Goddess Kring for 15 years, and maybe for the first like five or six years I was extremely driven to do it every week nobody could even stop me if they tried uh, but towards the end of the show I did it every every week for 15 years and um, towards the end of those few those 15 years I I would procrastinate and I had to push myself and then once I did my show I felt better but Let's just face it, I was a little burned out, and I'm going through that right now. This is uh, my second episode of my radio show, and I'm just thinking about my life. My current life situation is that it's like I, it's like I push myself to do things, and then I wonder, do I really want to be doing this? You know, even my art. Like, uh, obviously, I'm an artist, and I can't help but, but be creative in some way, but let's just say that, that people in my family wanted me to be an artist, because they're also artists. And so it's almost like when you come from a family of doctors and lawyers, you know, they expect you to grow up and be a doctor or a lawyer. And I sometimes wonder that about my artwork. Sometimes, you know, the fact that I'm driven to create, it's like I'm trying to prove something to somebody. Who am I trying to prove this to? Am I trying to prove this to myself, to God, to you, the audience? Who am I trying to prove this to? And what happened today was, oh, wait, okay, my story is, is that my boyfriend was like, well, why can't you just do what you want, and then if you don't want to do something, just say, eh, I don't want to do that, and then don't do it, because there's times when, like, mostly I take photographs, and I do really, really good creative photographs, and I put them all over the internet, you know, all over my social media, my regular website is shannonkringen.com, I have a Flickr and an Instagram, and I've had my Flickr for 11 years, 
and I have like thousands of photos on there and I have a YouTube channel I have 678 subscribers on my YouTube channel and I have like 10 years worth of video on there and so basically and I have a, a live journal that I've had for like 16 years so I, I express and create a lot and I share it online and I'm driven to do that but the truth about me is that is that I sometimes I think that I should be drawing and painting because I do a lot of abstract or I used to anyway do all, some abstract pure abstraction non-representational non art and I would just draw and paint and make designs and then um, take photos of them and I've done silk screening and printmaking. I mean, I've done lots of different kinds of art, but mostly I do photography now because I'm not very patient and I love the the quickness of photography. You know, it's instant gratification and you can instantly put it online. Whereas when I paint or draw something, I'm so into the internet that I feel like, okay, I did this painting or drawing, but now in order to share it, since I don't necessarily want to go hang it on a wall somewhere, I just want to take a photo of it so that it, it becomes digital art so that I can put it all over the internet and go look everybody and do my like Shannon Cringan show and tell you know of my art uh, but my boyfriend says well but you mostly take photos and you say you want to paint and draw but you don't seem to be doing that and I've been dating him for gosh two years now and I don't think I've been painting or drawing since I dated him I've mostly been taking photographs and writing poetry so now what I'm asking myself is, do I really want to paint or draw and I'm avoiding it, like avoidance, avoid dance, avoidance. It's part of one of my poems, avoidance. Um, or, you know, do I really not want to do it and I just think that I should? Because, I mean, I know creative people who say they really want to do whatever it is, but they're not doing it. And then I wonder, maybe they don't really want to do it and they just think they should. Like they think they would be cool or they like the idea of being the kind of person that would do whatever that thing is. Like if someone constantly says they want to write a book, but they never write, maybe they don't really want, do they not want to write a book and they just say that they do because they think it sounds cool or they wish that they were the kind of person that wanted to write a book or somebody else hopes that they write a book? Or are they just procrastinating? You know, are they just sabotaging? So I'm trying to ask myself that now. I'm like, Okay, here I am doing this monologue. Do I really want to do this monologue? Am I making myself do this monologue? And my boyfriend is like, hey, why does it have to be so complicated? Can't you just do what you want and just don't do what you don't want? You know, I mean, unless you like, you know, like little kids never want to brush their teeth, but you got to like make them brush their teeth or do your homework, brush your teeth, do your homework, clean your apartment, do the dishes, stuff like that. So today what happened was, I modeled for four hours, for seven hours actually. I modeled for a sculpture class at one art school and I did a four hour standing pose with a bunch of, you know, 20 minutes and then a five minute break kind of a thing for four hours. And then I drove my car in the freeway and went to a second modeling job and did three hours of shorter poses like 20 minute poses and two minute gesture poses for a drawing class. And so that was seven hours of modeling. And so basically, to make a long story short, I worked seven days this week. I worked every single day. I think I did seven or eight art model gigs. I delivered groceries, I think just once, maybe twice. And I did two medical model gigs. And then I did a store audit and a store demo. So basically, I work every single day. And there's times when I think, oh, I should take the day off. But the thing is, I prefer working. I like to work pretty much every day, making money, even though I'm still low income. So I don't know. It's like, gee, am I, real, am I really an artist? Like, yeah, I love to create. But the thing is, part of me is very nerdy and I love to make money. I love to just be of service to others. And um, I don't know if I'm a workaholic or if I'm just doing what I really enjoy by working every day. So I used to paint shoes, haven't done that in a while. I, st I painted shoes uh, starting in 1985 or 86 when I was still in high school. So, and one person, hello everybody listening, one person said, I have no idea how many people actually are listening to this radio show. So if you're listening, thank you very much. You can write me with questions or comments. Go to shannonkringen.com and find my email. Or you can, I guess you can contact me through the radio station. I'm not sure, but um, just find my email, shannonkringen.com. 
or find me on Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus or Instagram or YouTube or, you know, 20 million different websites that I share. I have five different blogs. I have a Tumblr and a WordPress and a Live Journal and a LinkedIn and I'm just all over the place. So I have uh, um, different, yeah, different ways that I share with people now and I forgot what I was just saying. I don't know how many people are actually listening, but if you are listening, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Shannon Kringen. I call myself Goddess Kring. I could explain. I guess I'm wondering what, what do you guys want me to talk about? I mean, I'll just make it up as I go, but if you give me feedback, you know, I'll talk about certain specific topics. One person wanted me to talk about when I was nine years old, my mom and I lived in Petaluma, California at an artist commune briefly. Uh, I'm not sure if it was really officially a commune, but my mom basically took art classes. We lived, I grew up in San Diego, and when I was nine, my mom decided we were going to move either to Hawaii, and we went to Maui, but it was too hot for her, but we hung out there. My uncle used to live in Maui. He used to be a chef, and he used to scuba dive a humpback whales, and he's also a very talented photographer. Another long story, but my mom decided she didn't want to move to Hawaii with me, so she decided we would um, maybe move to Whidbey Island because a girlfriend of hers decided to um, create a farm. We were living in the San Diego suburbs, and my mom's girlfriend was really into, she loved hawks, and she had a red-tailed hawk. In the San Diego suburbs, that's not a very common thing. She had, like, in her backyard a special, I think she rescued it, it was injured or something, and she had a hawk, and she wanted goats and more animals, and so she moved to the island, and my mom decided she would also move to Whidbey Island because of what her, her friend told her about the place, and my mom wanted to get away from the the Southern California um, atmosphere. So we decided to move, but on the way, my mom signed up for an art class because she was thinking maybe we would move to San Francisco or Petaluma, depending on how much she liked it, and if not, we would just keep on trucking and head up to Whidbey Island. So what we did was we we went to Evolution Art Institute in, I think this was 1977, when I was nine years old, and my mom signed up for a class, uh, a guy named Michael Gonzalez, I think, and he's, I think he, uh, he's an artist that probably still lives near San Francisco somewhere, and we signed up, my mom signed up for a class, and we, she ended up dating the person that taught this class, and that's another long story. He had a nine-year-old son named Demetrius, who I had a crush on, so he and I flirted with each other, two nine-year-olds. So my mom ended up um, sort of dating this person, and she learned Raku, and I just remember that my mom and I lived, this was the first time that there was no television. I grew up, you know, in San Diego suburbs with TV, and I used to roller skate all over the place and watch a lot of television, and it was actually good for me to be without a TV for once. But I thought I was going to die. I thought, I can't live. I have to play Lincoln Logs and I have to read books. Oh, my God, I can't live without a television. But sure enough, I, I did a lot of creative things without television in my life. I remember I wrote like a little book. I wish I still had that. But I did artwork and I wrote a little book, gave it to my dad. My, my parents are divorced. So I really missed my dad and my grandparents terribly. And um, so that's a whole nother story. But Basically, we lived with my mom's boyfriend, and she would stay up all night and um, fire a, a raku kiln with her boyfriend, and they did these clay vessels and sculptures and experimental art. And I learned as a little kid that the adults were teaching me. It was a bunch of old chicken coops in Petaluma, California on Robler Road, I remember, and I actually went back there a few years ago, and it's no longer there. Now it's just regular farms and houses there on Robler Road, Luma. Uh, it was called Evolution Art Institute in 1977, and I learned how to do metal smithing, silk screening, woodworking, clay, hand building with clay, raku with clay. 
um, throwing on the pottery wheel. I made jigsaws. I was a nine-year-old and the adults around me let me use a jigsaw. I don't know if they should have done that, but I could have cut my hand off. But I was a smart little kid and I made little jigsaws for the kids. I was only nine and, and there was a kindergarten up the road, like sort of a hippie school up the road in this big old barn and where there's handmade toys. And I thought, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna make the children some jigsaw toys. And so I was nine, and I was making toys for six-year-olds, and that's funny. So I thought they were kids, and I was a nine-year-old, so I could make them toys. That's cute. And I learned how to do buffing with metal smithing. And then there was um, sheep or goat. And I remember seeing black widow spiders and getting scared. I also remember we had like a solar-powered uh, shower. So basically my mom raised me in an alternative kind of way. She put me in an alternative school. To make a long story short, we stayed in Petaluma just for that one summer when I was nine years old, and then we headed up to Whidbey Island. And we lived in many different places, and there was many marriages and divorces and all kinds of interesting things. But um, yeah, that's part of the Petaluma story. But I just remember that that really did kind of help ignite my love for multimedia, you know, for the idea of working with wood, metal, clay, silk screening. Uh, I got to be around a lot of creative adults, and I just remember feeling very encouraged to explore and create so there's the little Petaluma story, but now I'm now it's back to 2016, and I'm I'm I just turned 48 on October 25th, 2016, and now I'm questioning everything. I'm thinking how many voices in my head are telling me what I should and should not do. I basically work so hard as I have like several jobs. I work as an art model for painting and drawing and sculpture classes. I sometimes get hired by photographers to model. I sometimes get hired as a photographer to photograph other people. Um, I audit stores. I do have done um, organic food demos at health food stores. And I also work with medical students at two different medical schools. I pretend to be a medical patient. And they do physical exams. They hire men and women both for physical exams. And then they get to practice their verbal technique and their diagnosis technique, as well as their like palpation and their, you know, phys clin, like their physical technique and their language, their professional medical language. And it's fascinating, actually, to work with these medical students. I really like doing that. I love being around medical people. They're very smart. They're very detail-oriented. They're really trying to do a good job. I just, I admire medical students a lot. They really work hard, and they're really focused, and... Um, there's times when I think I'm a little bit autistic because of the way I hyper, hyper, hyper focus on things. Finally today, my boyfriend got a little bit frustrated because I, I talk about Tom Petty a lot. And it's not really about Tom Petty, the rock star. It's just about what Tom Petty represents to me. He's like, a, I, I happen to love his music, as I said last week, but I also just see him as a symbol for many things. So about, about being brave and not letting anybody stop you from being who you really are. And just there's a certain kind of um, uh, feminine, masculine, rebellious, yet harmonious, uh, romantic, uh, angry, yet sweet. I don't know, there's just many different traits in his music. So it just, it just, it's kind of like he represents the wholeness of being a human. And it's sort of, he, he, Tori Amos and Tom Petty both sort of embody, I think, some of the wonderful traits of male and female energy that I love. So let's just say they're sort of like shamanistic, archetypal, um, you know, people in, in my, in, you know, it's like my own personal mythology, you know, instead of like the Greek gods and goddesses, you know, Greek mythology, I'm more into the whole like, Tom Petty, Tori Amos, they are the symbols for me of, of, they are like the Greek god and goddess. And just like I call myself Goddess Kring, that's kind of not like worship me, I'm a goddess. That's more like the god in me, like Namaste, you know, like they say in India, the, the god in, the goddess, you know, the magical divine in me, the spirit of me greets the spirit in you. So it's like everyone is a god and a goddess somewhere inside. And 
I'm I'm not really a religious person at all, but I'm not an atheist, and I'm very spiritual. And I another reason why I love Tom Petty and Tori Amos is I think they're both very spiritual um, uh, musicians. You sort of channel a lot of spiritual energy, and that's kind of how they write their songs. That's a whole other story, but. I would just say, also, I'm really happy that Bob Dylan won the Nobel uh, Prize for Literature. I know a lot of people think he didn't deserve that because he's just a songwriter. But to me, I listen to a lot of music, and I really pay attention to lyrics of songs and the melody. And to me, songwriting and song lyrics are like as much literature as actual literature, even though it's different. But to me, music is a real art form, and I take it seriously. And so to have an amazing songwriter such as Bob Dylan win an award like that, I think is really cool, and it kind of excites me. So um, I love Bob Dylan's music, new music, old music. There's such a huge body of work that he's done. I love his more recent album called Time Out of Mind and Oh Mercy. I think that's from the 80s and the 90s. And then, of course, his older stuff um, as well, but um, Blood on the Tracks and all of that. But I grew up listening to Bob Dylan because when I was in the crib, my dad used to play a lot of Joan Baez and Gordon Lightfoot and Bob Dylan. So I grew up hearing a lot of folk music when I was a little child in San Diego. And my mom played a lot of classical music in the house. So my mom was into really modern fusion jazz and classical, and my dad was really into folk and big band jazz and... uh, you know, good rock and roll as well. They were both into good rock and roll. So I was raised with lots of good music being played on the stereo at at both my mother and my father's house. I'm fortunate in that way. And what else was I going to say? I basically work so much. I have several jobs and mostly modeling for art students and medical students. And I basically don't have a lot of energy left over to do my art. And then I'm thinking... And financially, I'm doing okay, so I don't really have to work seven days a week. Like, financially, I'm okay. I live really, really cheap. I know how to live really frugal. So I don't really need to work as much as I do, and yet I'm driven to work and work and work. And so I guess I like to focus my energy. And I was going to say, I sometimes feel like I'm a little bit autistic because I... I just, I hyper-focus in a way and I feel like I constantly, I get overstimulated and I feel like I need something to help me feel more safe. I need structure. I need, I feel like Humpty Dumpty with no boundary. And I feel like when I work, when somebody says, okay, show up at this time in this place and do this for us, I just feel safe and secure. Like it, like it's partly about, yes, I'm earning money so I can pay my bills and I'm safe, but it's also that these people need me. I show up and I do my thing. Like, I'm kind of a loner, but I don't really know if... My boyfriend doesn't think I'm an actual loner. He thinks it's something else. But I definitely like my space and I like my solitude. And I'm driven to work, do my artwork, and do all the other things that I do to make a living. So I'm so used to doing my art for free. It doesn't occur to me to make money with my work, even though I have, like in you know certain ways off and on bits and pieces mostly I just take a lot of photos and give them away I've had like Bill Moyers um, and just different national websites have have uh, actually published a lot of my photos if you go to my Flickr website I offer my photos free to publish under Creative Commons license I was also going to talk a little bit about that on my show I thought I was going to like focus on different categories on each show. Maybe I'll get more organized later on, but right now I'm just going to do improv monologues. I like the whole Creative Commons copyright, lack of copyright. Basically, you offer your photos free for people to publish as long as they give you credit for being the photographer because I just love to share my work. So my Flickr has like hundreds and thousands of photos. I don't know how many photos I forgot. I think there's a few thousand, but um, I've had it for like 11 years since 2005 and there's just many different categories there's like over 900 self-portraits but there's also uh, many different um, close-ups of plants there's animal portraits there's water there's clouds there's abstract reflections and chrome and textures there's beautiful landscapes there's macro photography there's travel photography when I went to England and Scotland and the Bahamas and Norway And so I have like many different kinds of photos that I love to take and what drives me is composition, color and composition and the shape in the frame. 
So I'm driven to do that. And I feel like um, I'm not really sure what I'm what I'm really wanting in life other than I want to keep learning and healing and growing and expressing myself. And I also have a fear of success, I think, more so than I fear of failure. I mean, different people have different definitions of what it means to fail versus what it means to succeed. But I will say that, you know, I have a fear that if I'm too confident or successful, other people will be jealous of me or other people will think I'm on an ego trip or I'm arrogant or I'm on a power trip, etc. And I just cringe and I feel a sense of shame. And that's just sad. You know, the way some people feel ashamed when they fail, I think I feel kind of ashamed if I if I do well at something, I feel like, yeah, I did a good job. And then I instantly feel like, yeah, but I don't deserve this or, oh, no, I need to help somebody else. This shouldn't be all about me. I mean, it's just sad that I can't enjoy it. Like in high school, my dad used to be a tennis teacher and he's an amazing, amazingly talented athlete and um, tennis. Um, he used to he almost went pro. He almost got to play Jimmy Connors way back in the 70s, long story, but he was a tennis teacher for many years, and he taught me how to play tennis when I was a little kid, and I'm left-handed, which kind of gives me an advantage when I play tennis. And basically, in high school, I was on the tennis team, and I won every single match except the last match, which I lost 6-0, 6-0, because the, my tennis coach's daughter was an amazing tennis player, and she beat me 6-0, 6-0. But before that, I won every single match. Uh, but I remember one time I started losing and I started hyperventilating because I couldn't stand the idea of losing a tennis match and I started hyperventilating and then I ended up winning. But I would always feel guilty. I would always feel like, yeah, I won. I'm so glad I won. But then I would look at the face of my opponent and they would have this sad, frustrated look on their face because they lost, and then I would feel guilty. I would feel ashamed and guilty and like, oh, no, they hate me, you know, because I won and they lost. And so instead of enjoying winning the tennis match, I felt bad about it. So that's just sad and depressing, isn't it? That it's like we can't, you know, if you lose a tennis match, you feel like, God damn it, I, oh, forgive my language, I lost, and then if you win... Instead of celebrating, I felt guilty, like I should apologize or like I should help the person, cheer the person up that lost to me. So I guess competitive sports are really not for me because it's too stressful. I love animals, you know. I keep I keep thinking I want to do more with plants and animals in my life, but I keep not doing that. So And I keep thinking I should do this and I should do that and I should do my art. And, you know, I do my art. But what I mean by that is I, I sometimes think that I should, like, you know, paint and draw and like print my stuff out and, and try to get shows in galleries. And, you know, I've showed off and on in different coffee shops and I have showed in an art jury gallery before, but I've never tried very hard to get into a jury gallery. But part of the problem, too, is that is that my work is all over the map, like my photography and my pure abstract painting is very much I'm inspired by Hunter Wasser. Look him up. But uh Hunderwasser is spelled H-U-N-D-E-R-T-W-A-S-S-E-R. -S -S -E he is a fascinating artist slash philosopher from Austria. Um, and I'm inspired by his art and I'm inspired by... Um, I love photographers who do self-portraits. I love, I love Gaudi. I love Klimt. I love Francis Bacon. I love more abstract. I love Freddie Kylo. I love, I love any artist who does self-portraits, actually, because sometimes people give me a hard time about doing a lot of self-portraits. You know, I love being the model and the photographer, and uh, some people think it's really narcissistic, but I think a lot of my self-portraits are really works of art, and they're really beautiful, and so who cares if it's me photographing me versus somebody else photographing me. I mean, it's it's kind of cool when the artist is also the model, you know, the model and the photographer in one. So it's almost like I've cloned myself. When I photograph myself, it feels like, you know, I am the film director and the actor, you know. It's, it's just a fun thing to do. So I love, maybe it takes away my guilt, you know, because some people do think it's extremely narcissistic to take so many photos of yourself. But I also feel kind of shy, like when other people try to photograph me, I don't usually come off as confident because I'm not as confident. 
so when I photograph myself, it, there's a sense of relief, like, oh, finally I'm comfortable and I don't have to worry about offending anybody or, or, you know, I can go ahead and ham it up, you know, and it's not egotistical. So when I'm by myself, I just feel more comfortable photographing and creating, you know, um, projecting confidence and, and looking as beautiful as I can or, or, you know, emotional, expressing something emotional. When other people photograph me, I tend to be more uptight or I'm not as photogenic. I look kind of like the girl next door or whatever you want to call that. I don't look like a model when people photograph me sometimes. Although I did work with an amazing man named Monty Knowles in the Bahamas, and he's an amazing photographer, and I have worked with a handful of very, very talented photographers. It's just that generally I, I, I'm more uptight. You can just see the look on my face as I look uncomfortable. I look stiff. I look not as photogenic. It just really all depends on the angle and the lighting as well as what the energy that I project on my face. I've also noticed I'm a bit of a chameleon. And when I stand next to somebody and we do like a selfie together, I sometimes look a little bit like me and that other person look like we're morphing into each other. And also when people paint me or draw me, a lot of times it looks like a morph of me and them. So that's kind of interesting that the energy kind of combines and people end up looking like each other and absorbing each other's energy. Maybe that's what that is. I know in photography it's different. If you look like somebody in a photo and you're doing a selfie together, that's that's literally almost kind of magical. Like there's people that I don't even really look like, but when I did a selfie with them, I look a little bit more like them. It's almost like my face is mimicking their facial expression or something. I don't know what that is. Maybe I'm like a monkey, you know, that's imitating people or like a chameleon, so like I'm morphing. But then when people paint and draw you know, usually their paintings and drawings look kind of like the model that they are observing um, as well as themselves. And so because people know their own faces better than they know somebody else's. So I notice some people paint and draw me. It really does look like an offspring of me and them combined. Like we both had a child together and <laughs> here's our child, you know, a little bit of me, a little bit of you. It's just interesting. So thanks for listening to my random monologue. If you have questions or comments, just email me and uh, go to shannonkringen.com and find my email. So, or just Google Shannon Kringen or Goddess Kring and you will find my email address. So thank you for listening. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. This is improv monologue as opposed to dialogue. Forgive me while I kiss the sky. 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 Yummy honey dripping, dripping. 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 Hey, this is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring. Thanks for listening. Hey, guess what? Somebody told me um, cuz I need a, a like a like a a sound screen on my mic and somebody told me that I can just make one by taking a a thin cotton sock and wrapping it around my microphone and I've done that and I think it sounds a little better when I speak into the mic now I'm trying to not make icky sounds when I blow with my voice so I want to say thank you so much for tuning in to Goddess Krang Radio and I am open to questions and comments if you have show ideas or topics you would like me to discuss or any kind of special question you would like to ask me, maybe someday I'll have guests on my show. Right now I just want to do a solo thingy Mick Jagger Goddess Kring style. So bada boo, bada bing, stinging rings the Kring. Catch the wind song, spry will drive. Crack the code left and right node. So follow your bliss. I'll see you next week. <laughs> Si la concha, 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 si la concha
Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Any kind of special question you would like to ask me? Maybe someday I'll have guests on my show. Right now I just want to do a solo thingy Mick Jagger, Goddess Kring style. So bada boo, bada bing, stinging rings the Kring. Catch the wind song, spry will drive. Crack the code, left and right node. So... Follow your bliss. I'll see you next week. Goddess Kring Radio. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen.